Next presenter is Enrique Garrett. He's going to talk about the Longhorn Herd history. I think he's got some things that are going to reinforce what Dr. Sponenberg said. Everybody knows Enrique. He's South Texas. He's been in the Longhorn business probably longer than most of us put together. So, Enrique, take it away. All right. Uh, my talk is going to be on Longhorns, but more on the history, but also uh, proving what Dr. Sponberg was talking about. This is a drawing that came out in the New York Gazette, uh, and I put it there because these cattle are crossing the Rio Grande River from Mexico into Texas. I'm going to read something that describes the presentation it says, the history of the West was deep roots in South Texas, where the wild horse desert was a lawless land controlled by no authority. This Western region, South of Texas, from San Antonio to Corpus Christi, stretches West and South to the Rio Grande and beyond, was the birthplace of the big cattle ranches, the cattle barons, the rustlers, hide thieves, outlaws, bad men, operating on both sides of the border. Uh, all the, from 1867 to 1886, over 10 million head of longhorns left, left that area. A lot of them came from Mexico. And publishers out of New York were sending uh, draftsmen and painters uh, to, to describe for the readers uh, the happenings. Uh, it's, not very, it's a little clear right now, but you can make the outlines of the horns of the cattle. Uh, they're bony and all the heads are different. If you can see them, some are, go up and some go sideways. They all have twists. That's one of the most important things. The same, uh, same thing, uh, most of these were stolen cattle. And of course, they stole from both sides. Uh, the Mexicans uh, stole it from the Texans and the Texans stole them from the Mexicans. So. But the point I'm trying to make is the shape of the horns of the cattle. If you'll notice, they're different. You've got some that go sideways, some go up, some are twisted down. So you have all different shapes. There's, there's no set uh, set of horns that you can say, this is a longhorn herd. But uh, once they got across, uh, they were shipped. These cattle that came from Mexico and into Texas were bought by the Texas cattlemen for about a dollar a head. By the time they got to San Antonio, they were worth eight dollars. By, by the time they got to Abilene, they were worth twenty-three dollars. And by the time they got to New York or Chicago, they were worth forty-eight dollars. Here they're loading the cattle and uh, the word cowpuncher originated when these men, they were not cowboys, but they were working with cattle. They would punch these cattle up the chutes into the railroad cars and they became cow punchers and consequently that the name stuck. The others were not cow punchers, they were cowboys because they handled the cattle. Like I say, uh, after 1886, about 40 years later, this was all that was left of the 10 million head of cattle that were left. And this was a picture that was uh, uh, put out by the Adams Forney, Texas. Uh, and these were the uh, remnants of the cattle that uh, Captain Charlie Schreiner had. And you'll notice, take a good look at them. White face. High horned, probably Sagu blood, another one over there. 
another one over there. That was what was left of all those cattle that left. Next. And this is what it says. The last surviving herd of Texas Longhorns, 150 years ago, unusual sight it is today. This is 1936. They're just 46, but about 50 years after those 10 million head of cattle, that's what was left. The government contracted, one of the buyers for the, <clears throat> the government was uh, Graves Peeler. He was commissioned to find Longhorns for uh, res a reasonable facsimile of what they considered a Longhorn. And uh, I took some pictures, and these are the bulls that the uh, Wichita had. These were Wichita uh, bulls that they were using. Uh, some are fair and some of them I don't think would qualify by today's standards with the CTLR. Next. Here's another one. It's a very small brittle, small horn, bulldog type. There's another two bulls. They were, they were not the typical, what we would consider a, a perfect longhorn bull, but at least that's the best that they could come up with. There's another one, different color scheme. Horn, notice the shape of the horn, the coloration, confirmation. Here's two more. This is, this is, would be close to what we would consider today. This one on the right is a, is a younger animal, probably 18 months, two years most. But this is two of, of the several bulls that they were using. But there again, different conformation of horn, sway back. Next. It is a cow herd. You see a lot of this, this scheme quite a bit in today's herds. But look at the horns of the cow. They, they don't go out, they twist, but they go up. Here's another one. Very small, brittle, line back. You see a lot of this today, this color scheme. Here's another one. There again, look at the horns. Now she's got more uh, configuration of what we consider a decent cow in today's standards. So there's another one, D different, different um, horn configuration. Next, this is another one. This is kind of a canela. She's kind of a roan, but there again, they they twist, but they don't go out, they go up and then out. Yellow cows, all three have different horn configuration. But now you are starting to see uh, pretty good uh, confirmation on the cows. Here's another young cow. There again, you notice, you notice the size of the horns. They, 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 they weren't horn crazy. They, they, concentrated more on the, uh, the confirmation uh, and uh, the look of the general outlook of the cow rather than just the horns or the color. Here's a blue, a blue roan, which is very rare even today. Take a good look at her. Here's another one. These pictures are important because you're looking at cattle that the government owned what they called pure longhorn 60 years ago. The, the, and this was the initial herd that a lot of us tapped into. Next, another one. Different, different uh, color combinations. And uh, speaking of color, I want you to know that the, descent, the ancestors of all these longhorns uh, come from Spain, different parts of them, and there's more than 36 different combinations of colors in, in Spain. So trying to get 
a particular type of color, uh, good luck. I've tried it. <laughs> Next, there's another one. There again, you're starting to see a little bit improvement, but the horns, same thing. Again, next, there's the same cow. She's too big. This is, this is not good. There's another one. Interesting, look at her horns. Sway back, typical. There's another one. Same thing, next. Same thing again. Here's a gruyo with a big calf. This is one of their better bulls that they had. I think they considered him one of the, the top bulls at, at the time at the wildlife. This is another one of their better bulls. He was a dun. They used. The one before and this one was used quite a bit. In fact, a lot of the herd had the, those two bulls. And this was their prize bull. This was the number one bull that they had. And he was a premier bull. His horn conformation is, is very good, he, but he, he's very chunky. He was an old bull, and that, of course, it, his age shows his size. He was a yellow, yellow. Steer or bull, it's a bull. I'm not sure about this one, but I'll, I'll, I'll refer to him later. Next. Here's a kind of a chocolate colored cow. Notice her horns. All right, here, here's a change in the horns. The kind of a, now this, this you see a lot in today's herds but you don't see that long head as much as you did then in the old cows. After seeing, after seeing what the wildlife had, I had been working longhorn cattle for 20 years, and I, and I knew that there were remnants in Mexico of these cattle. So I decided to go out and try to find some, and it took me about two years, and I spent a lot of miles. I wore out a pickup because there were thousands of cattle, but they were crossbred. In the early 40s, uh, the, the Cebu came in from Brazil, and like everybody else that, that had uh, criollo or longhorn cattle, they wanted to improve the herd, they wanted to put more beef on them. They started crossbreeding in Mexico, all the ranches in northern Mexico, just like they did here in Texas. So I went out and I tried to find cows that were born before the importation of Brahma bulls. Those were the ones that were pure, and most of them were 15 to 16 years old. And out of thousands and thousands of head that I saw, there was a drought going on, so it was fairly easy to see. Uh, all the <clears throat> different herds, I was able to pick up uh, over time 68 cows and one bull that I figured uh, were pure descendants of the original longhorn cattle that roamed in northern Mexico and Texas. And this, is, this is one of them. She's laying down and look at her horn conformation in her ears, a big long head. This is Mexico. Next, here's another one. See the little ears, the fluted horns? And this is a very interesting scheme because you don't see this, did, at the time you didn't see this at the, at the Wichita. One cow or two maybe had it. But in today's herd, you see this because the descendants of these cattle that that I got together, I contacted uh, Grace Peeler and Heck Schrader, and they went down to my ranch and helped me put the herd together and pass on them. And like I say, it was visual inspection only because that's the only tool we had. So there were 
uh, Hex Schrader, who was the herdsman for the Wichita, uh, Graves Peeler, who was w one of the uh, original uh, uh, scouts for the Texas Longhorns. Uh, and uh, they helped me. You see this color scheme of the cows, but you see also the long head, little ears, high horn, and long, long legs and long tail. The tail's almost down to her, down to her hocks. Here's another one. We were looking for them, and uh, we, we would take, I would take a picture of the cow, because most of these cows were wild. I'd take a picture and get the earmarks and go to the next village, which might be 15, 20 miles away, and ask for the owner of that earmark. And he said, well, it's mine. I said, well, would you sell them to him? And I, and I did. I bought as many as I could that I wanted. I'm pointing them out. There's Charlie Schreiner on the right. He was with me on that occasion. I hired a team of ropers to go out into the brush country and, and mountains and rope them. And the way to get them out, we cut a path through to and I'm talking about an area of maybe anywhere from five to eight hundred miles radius. A different spot, we'd buy one or two here, three over there, one here, and that's the way it went. Here we've got the truck, and here are cow punches, <laughs> Mexican cow punches trying to get these skinny cows on top of the truck. Here we go. <laughs> Very efficient, technical way to do it. <laughs> and that's how we got them to the highway, which is the road there, to my ranch, which was about 400 miles away. Once we got them to a loading station, that's how we tied them up. And we are taking a look at them got different color schemes. There's Hex Schrader. I think that's Phillips in the middle. There's another unusual color. Next. Graves Peeler's somewhere in there. Next. Oh, there's that bull now. He's cleaned up and feeding on big, tall buffalo grass, so he looks better. There they are, next. There's that bull again. It's incredible what feed will do, isn't it? Some, this calf went to the, to the wildlife, some of those different colors. These albums, I, the only thing that I wanted to uh, let the membership see was the improvement that has been done in the last 50 years, well, I mean, when we started, let's say 20 some odd years ago, to now. I, I think all of us own herds that are much better than what we saw here. But this is what we had to start with. And uh, that, it, it proves out everything that the, Dr. Sponberg was talking about, cleaning the herd and purifying it and not crossbreeding, I mean, uh, not overbreeding, inbred. Thank you. That's it.